Hey everybody, welcome back to the YouTube version of Podcast of the Dragon. This is part two of my react video to the Dark Along the Ways. strong enough to become one of us, I hope I might still trust your discretion. I need a message delivered to the tower. There's a man we must find. Matt Cawthon. And to whom should I send this message? The Red Archer. It's the wind. Forget about the whispers. None of it's true. None of it. Thank you. What is she up to? Any detail would be helpful, no matter how seemingly small. It's quite invasive, this. You don't know what I am. No, no one does, thanks to I and I. I mean, if we revealed what you were, you'd be hounded every minute of the day. We'd be an asshole, Maureen. Big brooding one has. They're both big. And they both brood. <laughs> and the girls. White flame. And a ring of gold. I don't know. But they're all linked, all four of them. Is that unusual? Very. I see sparks of light trying to fill the shadows. And the shadows trying to swallow the sparks. I see the emerald in seat. She's going to be your downfall. We leave tomorrow. It's unreason. I really like men. I like how they did that. They're making it difficult to like Orain in some ways, like seeing her blackmail men. I think that moving men to Faldara makes perfect sense. Like there's no reason she has to be in Barlon. She has the kind of job and the kind of situation where you could pretty much stick her anywhere and it doesn't matter, so why not here? The cultural aspect or kind of the way that Moraine seems to be not actually that welcome in the Borderlands is weird because it seems so different or contrary to book canon, but it almost like there's this undercurrent, like there's history here. The fact that she blackmails men is shitty, but Min is a lot older in the show than she is in the books. In the books, she's only like 22, maybe. And this Min has to be probably closer to 28. So she's just significantly older. I really, really like her. She's like, I, love, I like her hairdo. And I like the way they did the visions. I think they did a great job with the visions. I don't want you to die. Any of you. But whichever of you goes to the eye of the world and is not the dragon. You will die there. Ground to dust between two forces of nature. You've made your choice. But we'll make our own. Powerful as you are, I don't think you can drag the four of us there against our will. Running, hiding. Won't save you from the weaving of the pack. You take everything she says as fact. This, this entire prophecy, the dragon reborn being one of us. We only believe it because she told us it's true. She can't lie. That doesn't mean she can't mislead. I'm not doing this because Maureen said we should. Or because I'm, I'm convinced she even knows exactly what she's talking about. I want to go to the eye of the world because if there's even a chance, she's right. Then it's worth it. If there's even a chance that wearing a mask will keep you from spreading COVID, you probably should. I appreciate that they're actually having the conflict between Egwene and Nynaeve play out so much earlier, and that it's played out over, like, very logical, reasonable conflicts, and less about, you're not going to tell me what to do with my life. I mean, or it is, but it's 
just like quick, like one scene and it's over. Like I step away from you and ask the Amarillan see what do we need to do? And it's like, yeah, you can tell Nynaeve's frustrated with Egwene because she's like, you're taking every fucking thing Moraine says as gospel. And Egwene's like, um, no, I'm sorry, but maybe all of you can like get out of your fucking feelings and use your fucking brains and your logic and think about it a little bit. Get over your fucking selves and how y'all feel about this. You know, because, yeah, feelings are treacherous. Feelings are transitory. How you feel about it all, it doesn't matter. If Moraine wasn't a part of this, you wouldn't think twice. Oh, you're right. Snap! You do it. She called you on that, Nynaeve. Don't let your pride stop you from doing what you know is right. What if we're throwing our lives away for nothing? None of us are the dragon. What if it is, man? Come on. Uh, you've never thought much of him, have you? Rand. You never gave him a chance. All right, he Stop. left us, Rand. You saw his face just the same as I did. He probably went back to Tarblon for that bloody stolen dragon. You don't dragon. know anything about he that. Left us. Well, I guess you're the expert on that, aren't you? Oh, don't be a shit, Rand. Parents like you fuck. What is that supposed to mean? Well, I'm apologizing for what? The truth. Stop! Just stop! I am so tired of you two fighting over her like she's something you can win. The day you proposed to Layla, that was the day Gwen and I got together. The only woman I've ever loved was my wife. I'm gonna be a shithead, Rand. I didn't. Yeah, Just... yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, you did. Good job, Nynaeve. That's what happens when the person who's like the adult in the situation is barely an adult. Sometimes like at that age, it's like you do have quite a lot more wisdom than the other people, but that doesn't mean you've got very much. This is Nynaeve. Nynaeve, this is everyone. She is beautiful. I haven't noticed. <laughs> Thank you for including me tonight. Oh, that's like sincere in a way that like almost nothing else is to just thank you for including me. Because, like, they're so awkward together, and this is really awkward in its own way. Like, it's cute, and it's very sweet and endearing, but it's awkward as fuck. But, yeah, just thank you for including me is really sweet. You gotta have a conversation. And it's awkward. Good night. Well, that's kind of rude, but oh, nice bedroom. That's nice. I waited in my room for an hour for you to come and apologize. How dare you think for even a second that I don't care about Matt? That I wouldn't fight for him, die for him. I scared. I still am. We're coming back. All of us. Listen to me. You need 
need to go to the White Tower and become what you've always wanted to be. I'll come with you to the White Tower. Every ice and I need some water. Did you really think I'll let someone else be yours? Way to go, Amazon. Make it all sweet and wonderful so you can crush the souls out of us and make it hurt so bad. Yeah, everybody's gonna get their phone on tonight, but poor Perrin's gonna be, like, sad and alone. I will always stand by you, you know that. What happens? What comes? I hope they work together better in the show than they do in the books. She's like, that's a turn off. Rocky, I was taken by the night so long ago. I never quite understood why you bonded yourself to Marie. It's a really personal question. You finally belong. To her. Like that narrative a little bit. If it's gonna be like they fuck one time and then she tells him, you know, yeah, no more because you're not a free man. I like that better than his, like, you know, oh, I can't give you widow's weeds as a bridal dress, melodramatic bullshit. This is a much more suitable narrative, particularly for this day and age. It gives her agency, and it's just better all around. She doesn't know. I mean, the way those kids on you. It's not the same, man. Oh, he remembers. Gary? It was so hot. I didn't mean to find her there, but I had to get away. He was crying. Yes. He was so tiny. What are you talking about? That door is made of iron. Three men your size can break it back. Once you do, there's no turning back. Well, that's kind of cool how they did that. amazing how they can do that now with the technology just kind of like stick michael mckelton's face on some younger person's body and just kind of like smudge the lines that's pretty fucking great this baby's like it's fucking cold So he wants to know ahead of time that it's him so he can go forward and say, I'm the dragon, and they have to stay behind. I like that. That's a very brand thing to do. What do you see now? Rainbows and carnivals and three beautiful women. I also like that they're meeting like this. This is nice. Do you see the eye of the world? Wish I didn't. Why? You seem like a decent person. She's like, somebody got some. My one issue here is how did Egwene get her clothes back from the white cloaks? I don't feel like she had time to grab her shit while they were fleeing. So it's like Perrin has a new shirt because they cut his old shirt, but she should conceivably have an entirely new wardrobe. I could 
can sleep. I owe you an apology. I appreciate that too. Nynaeve actually apologizes in this show. So, what did you decide? I want to go. She's like, God damn it. Where's Rand? It's Moraine's room. Okay, that was a really good episode. It had a lot of really good visual stuff. Love the flashback at the beginning with the blood snow. I wish when Rand, like, wakes up and he sees back to carrying his father through the woods. First of all, I didn't like the incongruity of the fact that he's carrying his dad, like, in a fireman's carry, but he's got him on the horse when he brings him into the village. That's just a little bit of, like, nitpickiness on my part. I wish that... There was just like even 30 seconds more to that scene for just a tiny bit more dialogue to play out. But it is nice to know that that's been like going on. The bit where Min sees him with, the, you know, the dad with the hair and Mark's sword in Tarvalin, I don't like that at all. I feel like that is an unnecessary bit of storytelling that is not needed. You know, there's no need to tell that bit of the story because they already told that bit of the story with the writing. We knew that. We got to see, you know, Tam hold Tigraine's hands while she gives birth to Rand, and then Tam, you know, we get the flashback to the fever dream where he's saying he was so tiny, you know, you don't need her to say, I saw somebody with your sword walking through the streets of Tarval and saw sheep in two rivers. That's an extra tie that is utterly unnecessary because like, yo, we get it. Your audience is intelligent enough to understand that. And B, it just seems too convenient. To me, that's l not just lazy writing, but utterly unnecessary writing. So gonna give it marks down on that. But that's, I think, about the only thing I'm gonna mark it down on. I feel like the drama stirred up between Perrin, Egwene, Rand, like 90 stirring that shit up almost seems like it's unnecessary drama, except that the kind of flavor of it has been there, but that it's like parents saying he's never loved another woman except his wife, even though the voice in his head or match and shin in his head telling him, you're glad Layla died because you're in love with another woman. So it's like, yeah, he does love Egwene, you know? And, you know, maybe how he loves her is all muddied up or whatever. What I didn't like about that was I did not want sophomore conflict between Rand and parents. The one thing I wish they had not done was have Niney be like, I'm tired of you guys fighting over her. Because it's like, it didn't seem like that was ever what was going on. And while that may be Niney's unreliable narrator bringing a conflict that never actually existed, it was just kind of like Perrin had feelings and Rand was oblivious to those feelings. It just seemed like it started up for no reason except to let's have an awkward conversation about it. So didn't really care for that. Other than that, though... You know, a lot of people who take serious issues with certain things are taking issues because it's like a change from the picture that they had in their head. So it's sort of like, yeah, some of the culture in Faldar sits the wrong way with me. Like, I don't care for the way Lord Agamar treated his sister. Part of me is like, well, wait, Lon didn't have any living people left at this time in the story. But, you know, realistically stepping back, it's like, so what? Those people being alive allows for a way to tell a story about Lon's background and have it not be total exposition the way the story of Lon is told by Lord Agamar in the Eye of the World, where because there are no living Malkyrie left, there is no way to show a story of, you know, Lon sits down to dinner with some people, 
Lord Agamar just has to give you an information dump story about what happens with Lon and the tale of the last of the Malkiri. So overall, I thought this was an excellent episode. Having gone back and thought more about the previous two episodes, I also think that they were better than I gave them credit for when I first watched them through, which is why I am watching now trying to check my feelings when things kind of press against canon or how I feel like they should be and look at it more from how's the storytelling? Is it effective for storytelling? So I appreciate that. I appreciate that, you know, you see that, yeah, people go to the White Tower in Lady Amelisa, but don't become Aes Sedai because they're not strong enough, you know, but they can still channel, they can still have the ring. I do really appreciate that. I feel like Lord Agamar being all blustery and... We don't need White Tower help. That seems utterly unnecessary, and it seems very counterintuitive to the very nature of a borderlander or a good ruler in the borderlands to be blustery and not wanting Aes Sedai help. Um, that seems foolhardy. That almost would make me feel like, rather than Ingtar being the dark friend, Lord Agamar is the dark friend? I don't know. But anyway... Overall, I thought this was an outstanding episode. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for coming to the YouTube version of Podcast of the Dragon and watch my react video for episode 7, The Dark Along the Ways. And thanks for watching, everybody.